Good evening and welcome to another sermon. My name is Mandara Shaka and if you're joining us for the first time, this is John the Baptist Ministry. This evening we have chosen to go for a more family life kind of topic. And the topic tonight is when parents set themselves up for failure or for tears rather. When parents set themselves up for tears. Uh, if you like the content that you will hear today, please consider subscribing and coming back and viewing our other messages that we have on our channel. We are found both on YouTube and on Facebook under the same name, John the Baptist Ministry. Before we discuss this important topic, I invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Let us pray. Kind, loving Father, Lord, I thank you for yet another opportunity to study your word and I invite you in the person of your Holy Spirit to come and to help me because this is not my work, it is your work. And Lord, this truth will only make it into people's hearts only when it is accompanied by your Spirit. So I pray, Lord, that you may teach me and teach others both through this same Spirit. Let this truth, Lord, lead to stronger homes and a turning around from our evil ways so that we may become fully your people in all our doings. In the wonderful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So when parents set themselves up for tears. Now, we all come from families. And most of us, if there's more than one of you at your house, you probably have realized that your parents tend to have a favorite. And the question I'd like to start by asking this evening is, do parents have a right to love one child better than another. And if, as you're listening to this, you can relate to this experience, maybe share your experience with us in the comments. If your parents loved you more than your siblings, more keen to hear from you, how did that make you feel? Did it make you feel like you were superior, you were better? And on the contrary, if your parents hated you, how did that make you feel? I know it's not a, a nice experience to convey, but hopefully it will strengthen this message as people share their personal testimonies as well. And the question I ask myself is, do parents have a good reason? Is there a good enough reason for parents to love one child over another? I've met people who say, because a child was sickly when they were young, you know, they just get an extra care. And what happens is the parents eventually become blinded and then they start favoring this one child. Or because they thought this was the last born and another child comes after that and that child is just re resented because that child was unplanned and so on and so on. Do parents have a good reason to love one child over another? I think that's the big question, the main question I would like to try and answer from the Word of God this evening. So come with me on this journey into this quest where we look in Scripture to see how God would help us answer this question. I found this quote and I think it really makes sense. I think it would resonate with those who were on the negative side of this equation of favoritism of parents and children. It says favoritism, the only one that says it does not exist. The only ones, rather, that say it does not exist are the ones getting it. So the children, apparently, who tend to believe that favoritism does not exist, there's no such thing in the home, are those ones that are highly favored. The other ones, obviously, feel the pain and feel the exclusion. And I think this picture really puts it properly, where mommy bird is standing over the other child to feed the other child. So let's look in the Bible. And I think in Genesis chapter 25, verse 27 and 28, looking at uh, Jacob, Esau, and their parents, we read the following. So the boys grew, talking about Esau and jo Jacob. Esau was a skillful hunter a man of the field, but Jacob a mild man, dwelling in tents. 
And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. So here are parents with two children. The one parents gravitate towards the other child. The mother loves the younger and the father the older. And each one have their own reason for loving one over the other. And if you follow these stories, you see how even in old age, these children are still being loved one by the other parent and the one by the other. And the impacts of all of this are clear if you read the Bible. And I'm not going to focus too much on this story today. I'm actually going to go a bit deeper into uh, the story of Jacob and how he repeated the same thing with his children. And I'm interested in the second generation because I believe that Jacob should have understood that the fact that his father did not love him as much as he loved his brother, it was a painful thing to endure. And I feel like Jacob should not have exposed his children to the very thing he was exposed to. Actually, if you look at the story of Jacob and you follow it, you actually realize that the bar for salvation was set higher by the parents because of what Rebecca and uh, Isaac did to the children. Jacob ended up stealing the birthright from Esau. And because of that, the whole family was broken. And this was all because there were favoritisms in the house. And it was much difficult. Jacob had to repent a lot more. There was a lot of work he had to do. He ran away to his father's house, to his uncle's house, and he spent years there, and he was cheated just like he cheated his brother. And it took a lot for him to be right with God. I believe it need not have been so. So let's read about Jacob and his children. And we read in Genesis 37 verse 3, Now Israel, who is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons. Again, we see the very person who was a victim of being loved less by his father, loving his son. He had a good reason because he was the son of his old age and also his mother had died. So he felt he had a reason, a right to love him more. And we read, and he made him a robe of many colors. Now, if you've read the story of Joseph, you know this story quite well. But I'm also going to summarize the impact or the purported impact of this whole preferential treatment that Joseph receives from his father. We read in 37 verse 3, Jacob tore his clothes. He put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. So the brothers, because of their jealousy, had sold Joseph into slavery. They could have done worse. They planned to kill him. But the Lord, I believe, interposed on his behalf. And Joseph grows up in slavery. He grows up in Egypt, in a foreign land, because of the love that his father had for him over his brothers. The love that the father had over the son broke both the father and the son's hearts. It brought separation. It brought alienation and hate in the family. Now again I ask, is there a good enough reason for a parent to prefer a child over another? Is it worth it having other children growing up feeling hated, growing up feeling like spare children because a parent has more preference for another child over his other his or her other children. I do not believe it is so. And I will show what the Bible says about this later. Let's look another at another incident in the Bible around the very same issue. Now, we're going to look at David and his two sons. So David had many children. And his very firstborn, his name was Amnon. And then he had another son whose name was Absalom. Now, the story here is about when Absalom murders his big brother Amnon. And the reason why was because 
Absalom had a sister. And because David was king, he had many wives. So these two were not from the same mother. Amnon raped Absalom's sister from the same mother. And because of that, Absalom ends up murdering his brother. So we read here in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 28 to 30. Now Absalom had commanded his servant, saying, Watch now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, Strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not be afraid. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and valiant. So the servants of, of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded them. Then all the king's sons arose and one got on his mule and fled. So there was a, a feast that was thrown and all of this was a plan that Absalom had to kill his brother because of what he had done. And we'll read a bit of commentary around all the issues that were surrounding this death that had happened. We also read of the same account. So when David, at first when David firstborn son raped his sister David did nothing about it he kept quiet you would think it would never be so David was king it was his job to judge between the people of the country but yet David failed to judge between his own children he failed to deliver sentence he failed to give justice to his own daughter and his own children and thus because of that his children end up killing each other now even after Absalom had killed Amnon, David still did not intervene. And Absalom grew bolder and bolder because of that. And we read in the book 2 Samuel 15 verse 30, where Absalom is chasing his father and he is wanting to usurp the throne. We read, so David went up by, ascent, by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up. And he and his head, sorry, he had his head covered and went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went, went up weeping as they went up. What a shameful thing for a king to do. Because of his own child whom he could not control. David had bitterness of heart. David had a humiliating experience in front of the whole country because of his household being in disrepute, because of him failing to deliver justice first in his house before he could try to deliver justice in the land. And then we read further about David and his household. We read in 18 verse 33 of 2 Samuel, then, king, sorry, then the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, if only I had died in your place, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. So it happened that after all the things that Absalom had done, trying to usurp the government from his father, Absalom was killed because of his revolt. There was a conflict, a clash between the royal guard and Absalom's man, and Absalom was slain. And we find David here crying for his son. It is not wrong for one to cry for their child when they are slain. But you will see how this was perceived by the people in the next text that we're going to read. So the people perceived this in this light. So Joab's rebuke to David, we read it in 19 verse 5 to 6 of Second Samuel. Then Joab came into the house of the king and said, Today you have disgraced all your servants who today have saved your life, the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives, the lives of your concubines, in that you love your enemies and hate your friends. For you have declared today that you regard neither princes nor servants. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. And I think Joab really captures the moment with his words. Because Absalom did not die doing something that was mighty, something that was an act of bravery. Absalom died disregarding and putting his parents to shame 
trying to remove his own father from the throne so that he himself may be proclaimed king. And in this act of cowardice, in this act of rebellion, he died. And instead of standing with the people and encouraging them in the right that has been done, in the wrongs that have been righted in the country, David is weeping. David is not seen in public. David does not come out to encourage the people and to thank them for for smothering out the wrong in the country. And Joab comes to him and says, it would have pleased you if all of us had died and your son Absalom had lived. So David has seemed to have a problem with how he was raising his children. David had a tendency to spoil his, his children. And there was a problem in the whole country because of this. Now let's read a bit of commentary on this whole issue that was happening in David's house. We read from a book called Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 72. This book is also by Ellen G. White, one of the authors that I quote from quite a bit. And we read, The shameful crime of Amnon, who was the firstborn, was permitted by David to pass unpunished and unrebuked. I've already told you what Amnon had done. Amnon had raped his own sister. And the author continues, The law pronounced death upon the adulterer and the unnatural crime of Amnon made him doubly guilty. So rape was something that was punishable by death according to the law of Moses. But the fact that Amnon had raped his own sister made it even worse. So David as king was supposed to make sure that he put his own son to death so that the land may have peace. Because how could David deliver justice to the residents of Israel when he failed to rule his own household. But we're told that two years went by and David did nothing about it. He tried to sweep it under the rug. We read, but David, self-condemned for his own sin, failed to bring the offender to justice. For two full years, Absalom, the natural protector of his sister, so foully wronged, concealed his purpose of revenge, but only to strike more surely at the last. At a feast of the king's sons, the drunken licentious Amnon was slain by his brother's command. So David had failed to do his job. There was supposed to be justice delivered, but David loved his son more than he cared about delivering justice. Now, in many households, when there's a favorite child, that child does no wrong. Actually, other children get in trouble for things that have been done by the favorite child. And we see this happening in David's household. He's very firstborn. One who should have been the natural heir to the throne. We find him raping his own sister and David doing nothing about it. Love blinds the parents or partial love blinds parents from exercising justice amongst their children. And you can see how David's household was rent asunder because of this. Continuing into the next paragraph, we read, David had neglected the duty of punishing the crime of Amnon. And because of the unfaithfulness of the king and the father of the impenitence and the impenitence of the son, the Lord permitted events to take their natural course and did not restrain Absalom. When parents or rulers neglect the duty of punishing iniquity, God himself will take the case in hand. His restraining power will be in a measure removed from the agencies of evil so that a train of circumstances will arise which will punish sin with sin. So when parents will punish children who are blameless and fail to deliver justice, the author is saying here, God will allow things to happen so that justice is delivered in a most painful way where sin will be paid back with sin. So parents, be aware that God lives and he will deliver justice when you fail to do so. We continue. So 
I've summarized here the lessons that we can derive from all the stories we've just looked at. The first one is that petted children become spoiled. And you can see it in David's household. You could see it in the houses of household of Isaac and his children and into their grandchildren. Their parents become unable to control them. So once you love a child too much, that child tends to know that they are the favorite. And because of that, they get out of control. Children do not get along because of one being loved more than the other. We saw that with Joseph and his brothers. They colluded and wanted to kill him because he was the favorite of his fathers. And God is not biased. His blessings are not based on people's choices, but based on a person's character. So the good thing is, even when parents has, have messed up in some instances, God still restores those children and still blesses them to a certain extent. And we thank God for that because if God would not interpose, Satan would make sure that those children are destroyed and he would ruin generation after generation because of the faults and the mistakes of the parents. Children of weak character are made worse and sometimes become altogether useless because of being preferred over their siblings. I mean, you look at the the character of Absalom. So Absalom knew that his father was a weak man. He would not correct things that happened in the household and you could see how his character developed. And this happens in households all over the world. And parents will imperil the lives of others to protect their wicked children. We saw it twice in David's household. First, by protecting Amnon, he was protecting a rapist that could go raping, go on raping, because justice would never be delivered against him because he was the son of the king. The same goes for Absalom, for whom he wept bitterly. So justice is perverted when there is favoritism. Parents go to the extent of bribing judges and paying lawyers just so their children can be exonerated from wrongs that they have committed because they are spoiled. And that is wrong because God will interpose and he will punish both parent and children for that. Some of these favorite children amount to nothing in life and are nursed by their mothers forever. I'm sure we all know someone who was a spoiled child, raised as the golden girl or boy by their parents, and this person became really useless in life, and they make nothing out of their lives, and they live with their parents forever. That is what I'm talking about. And the unloved children grow up feeling resented and are wounded for life. I mean, put yourself in the shoes of those children that are overlooked, the black sheep of the family. They have done nothing wrong. They do not deserve any of that. They have not chosen to be born into that family. But because the parents have small minds and cannot equally distribute love amongst their children, they wound and break their children for life. And we know that God's justice is fair. So where a wrong is done, God will make sure that justice is done. The parents sin against their children and against God by so doing. And when, when parents grow old, and this is, where it really gets bad. When the parents grow old, they expect the children to get along. But this never happens. The family is forever broken. Many parents think that they can favor their own favorites. And then when they're older, everything will just fall into place and they will have a peaceful retirement. But this never happens. So if you're a parent and you're just started, really think carefully about the steps you are taking because God will intervene and God will make sure that justice is delivered. So we find in the Bible, I'm going to cite two examples and there's many places where you can find God warning people against the sin of impartiality. In James chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, we read, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted 
by the law as transgressors. So to all parents who are favoring a child over another, the Bible says you are committing sin. And we know that the penalty of sin is death. So no parent who does not repent of the sin of showing partiality over a child will see heaven. And it becomes more difficult because when you're a parent, you can never undo the damage on a child that you had by showing partiality, by choosing to dislove or dislike them over their brothers and sister. That scar usually is there for life. It is not an easy fix. So tread carefully, parents. The next verse is found in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. And we read, I truly, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So if you show no partiality, you are counted as a person who is working righteousness. Because we've learned that partiality is sin. So impartiality is righteousness. So parents, if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to be holy as God calls you to be, cease from being partial and love all your children equally. The final scripture that I want to share with you is found in the book of Psalms, chapter 27, verse 10. And we read here, When my father and my mother forsake me, The Lord will take care of me. So to those of you who are the black sheep of the family, to those of you who are hated by your parents for no reason, take courage because the Lord will take care of you. And the Lord will pay you back double. He will make sure that you are abundantly blessed because your parents wanted to see you fail. They wanted to see you broken. But God will take care of you. And God is fair and we thank God that he is not like any human parent. He does not show partiality. So I hope this encourages someone. And I hope that those who have grown up being hated, being dubbed the black sheep of the family for no reason, may see that it is not their fault. They could not have done anything. As a child, you're born into a family. You deserve to be loved equally as children. And no one should reserve a special place. So there's nothing you could have done and you should stop beating yourself up. But you should thank God that God accepts you and God loves you and he will take care of you. So you can go to him and he will heal your wounds and he will make sure that you receive double from him. Let us pray. Kind, loving Father, Lord, I thank you for this short and straightforward message. And I pray, Lord, that it may encourage someone. I pray that it may also warn those who are on the path of destruction, who are segregating against their own children and causing untold harm and heartache upon their their children. I pray, Father, that you may arrest that train of destruction and you may help them to see and to repent and to love their children and to build strong families. Please forgive all of them. And if I as a parent have shown any of that, Lord, help me to see it and help me to stop it while I still can so that my children and my family may enjoy peace into eternity. Be with us in the new week and watch over us in the wonderful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.